Hey guys, hope you're all having a fantastic day. We're back here at Dragon Man's. We're going to be doing a uh, shooting day, but we also are going to be doing the museum. So we're not going to be filming the shooting today. We're just going to be filming the inside of the museum tour by Dragon Man himself. And uh, we probably won't do much talking. We'll let him do all the talking and just kind of capture it on video for you. Thanks, and we'll see you guys inside. We're here with Dragon Man today, about to do his museum, <laughs> full auto master right here in Colorado. Make sure you come down to his museum tour if you want to have a great weekend. He does it was Monday, Wednesday, Friday. That's right. And uh, you can rent full autos. You can go to the range. You can go paintball. You can go dirt bike. You can do whatever you want here within wow, reason. Good. You need a job? Yeah, I do. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you got a shot at the bottom. We need target holders. Okay. <laughs> I'll put it out this way. Yeah. If you run, uh, you get double. Oh, okay. You got a golf course? You can hit golf balls too? No, we don't want all the people here. <laughs> get that out. And I uh, want to thank you all for coming to see the museum. We have a nice small group here. Uh, last Sunday and uh, 4th of July, we had over 100 people each day. So that's a little too many, but you know, we don't want to turn anybody around. So, uh, you know, we're going to see my museum. It's going to take about two hours to go through the building. It's 75,000 square feet. We go all the way back to George Washington. Now, if you young kids didn't know it, he's on your one dollar bill. Right. He was the president, 1789. Right. Okay, so the American Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. So that's a lot of history to cover. And in the next two, two hours, you're going to learn more with me and Justin here than you learned in the whole time you went to school. I guarantee it. Anybody have any questions before we go in the back? Okay, if you have to go out from Europe, I have uh, 1,500 uniform mannequins, over 2,000 working weapons, real guns, real machine guns, real bullets. It's my private collection. We have nothing to do with the government. That's how I could get away with all that. Uh, I have a room for every major country uh, that the uh, U.S. was involved with. Uh, my Ukraine room isn't done yet. We're working on it, but uh, that's just a joke. <laughs> but uh, you guys are really going to learn a lot today. Okay, as you go through. Please, please try not to touch anything. Even though we have plenty of stretchers and first aid kits in here, my back's too sore to carry anybody out today. Okay? So let's not have any accidents on my watch. Um, so, what trying to change history? And we can't forget about that history. Um, because those men and women that died for our country and that served our country give us the freedoms that we enjoy today. You know, especially the ones that did give that ultimate sacrifice. I always like saying, it was General Patton on a Memorial Day address said, it is foolish and wrong to mourn the men who died. Rather, we should thank God that such men lived. And because those men lived, we're here enjoying our freedoms today. On that note, um, please take all the pictures and videos you guys want. The FBI and the ATF already knows what he's got in this museum. <laughs> on that note, do we have any FBI or ATF? 114 U.S. soldiers and between 10 and 12,000 Allied soldiers. All I can say that it must have been just hell on earth. Those guys come in storming those beaches that day uh, to go in and take over.
my right hand side, for example, you will see a lot of knives and daggers. These are ceremonial in nature. Every single one of them is different, and every single one of them were taken out of his palaces. I always like showing this picture because if you here to my right, you'll see a scrapbook. This is actually Saddam Hussein's scrapbook. Anytime he was mentioned in the news, he would cut those articles out, built this scrapbook. He was pretty full of himself. The hookah that you see, this five-foot hookah, was actually used uh, by Saddam Hussein to take out of his skin. Why they wouldn't put two gallons together? The second one didn't work. That's right. If the first one failed, they're going to get him with the second one. And the last picture you see on display there is about 30 seconds before he was actually hung and put to death. All right, folks, if you want to follow me down, we're going to go into our Afghanistan route. This is every American gas oh, man from 1917 when chemical and biological weapons were first used in 1914 uh, against uh, the British. The Germans used the chemical and biological weapons against the British and then the Americans in 1917 to 1918. So as the years go by to what they were in today. The last ones from the Air Force, the one next to us from the Army. The rarest gas mask I have, you'll probably never see another real one. I talk to museums all around the country for over 25 years. Not one museum I talk to has a real baby gas mask from Belgium or France. The moms used to put the whole baby in the gas mask and pump the charcoal filter on the left side. The next rarest one I have, I only have two of these. This is the waterproof uh, rubber gas mask. And that was uh, issued to all the GIs June 6, 1944, when they hit Omaha and Utah Beach. But luckily, the Germans didn't use any chemical or biological weapons on the Americans or the Allies on D-Day. If they did, if you watch that movie, Save Private Ryan, yeah. all the soldiers had these gas patches on their right arm. And this would turn blue, like my jeans, if there's agents in the air. Like that COVID-19, there's no odor. So by the time you know you have it, it's too late. So that was a real good idea. Probably some Jewish guy invented this. <laughs> yeah, not sure. Okay, come on. One I ever shot here about 13, 14 years ago was the 57 millimeter, and I won't do that again. I shot it up my 220 yard range, which is uh, 660 feet long, and the berm, that's the pile of dirt that stops the bullet, was 30 feet thick, and the whole thing collapsed. So it took me like two days to put the dirt back up with my front end loaded. So I'm, uh, I gotta wait for the Russians to come to use these. <laughs> uh, to own one of these, you have to put in for a destructive device permit, which is very, very hard to get, especially after the 9-11 20 years ago. The government really doesn't want the public to have weapons as powerful. Okay, this here is the 106 millimeter. It was uh, main designed in 1950 for Korea. It was hauled around on the M38A1 Jeep. See, there's a picture of it with the split windshield, so the barrel can almost lay on the hood. In Vietnam, it was hauled around on the 151A2. This here is a uh, spotting rifle on the top, and that would shoot one of these tracers uh, so the artillery sergeant could get an idea where the shell's going to go. Anybody have any questions? Most of those were located at the Brooklyn shipyards and the New Jersey waterways to load up all the heavy crates of food, ammunition, and weapons onto the ships. I was real lucky to get one of these. The LA made 320. Over the last 35 years, I had seven vehicles shipped back from Europe, and this is one of them. It's called the Scout Car. 
And when you come up the deck here, take a look at the pictures, the way I received it, 65% of this vehicle was missing. That's how rare it is. But I really wanted it because I'm going to tell you why in a minute. All the parts I couldn't find from other collectors around the United States, I made in my machine shop. And now it's like brand new. The white trucking company in Cleveland, Ohio, only made these 1938 to 41. And this is the vehicle the half track was designed out of. They took the rear end off the scout car, developed the track system, put it in back of the scout car, and it became a half track. They only made half tracks 1941 to 45. And look how nice it's all done. See, we got uh, your, uh, the original uh, radio that belongs in there. Uh, this gun here, this is a uh, 1919 and it's got a skate rail. It goes 360 degrees around the vehicle. Okay, the next uh, display, we're going to go over the deck and talk about the World War II Russians, not Putin. Okay. <laughs> some people taking some pictures of that motorcycle kind of resembles a BMW okay actually the BMW R71 but it's not the Russians actually stole the design from BMW in 1939 reverse engineered it came out with the IMZ Euro motorcycle they produced about 9800 of these in World War II Dragon Man has two in the museum and they are both operational the submachine guns you see on the back uh, counter here, the black one is our PPS-42, and the most produced submachine gun of World War II is the wooden-handled one, the PPS-H-41. This machine gun off to my right here, this is a PMM-1910, better known as the Maxim machine gun, okay, because it was created by Hiram Maxim in 1910. It was updated in 1930, then again in 1941. This one fires about 650 rounds up to about 1,000 yards. The one you're looking at is water-cooled. There's an air-cooled version of this one, too. And believe it or not, a couple weeks ago I saw on the news that the Ukrainian forces are actually still using this weapon system. You got of everybody. Tell you the truth, if Hitler listened to his uh, generals, we probably all wouldn't be here today. This is the fastest shooting machine gun in World War II. The MG-42, see those 8 millimeter bullets hanging out of the receiver? They were packed 1938. See the date? Yeah. 1938. All the head stamps on all the ammunition in World War I and World War II is all dated. They stopped doing that during Korea. That's why it's so collectible. They dated like everything. Okay, so the Germans had the fastest shooting machine guns. They had the Bismarck, the biggest battleship. They had the Tiger tanks, a 70-ton tank. Uh, 88 millimeter guns. Uh, they developed and used the first jet fighter uh, in World War II in 1944. They had the V-1, the V-2 flying bomb, way ahead of everybody. But Hitler woke up one morning and decided to take over Russia. June 22nd, 1941. All his generals told him it was a bad idea, but you can't tell Hitler what to do. He'll send you to the gas chamber. So uh, June 23rd, he sent over three million soldiers to Russia. One million to Stalingrad, one million to Leningrad, one million to Moscow. 1941 winter was the coldest on record, 31 below zero. 80% of all his soldiers were still wearing that summer uniforms. He lost half his men that one winter, a million and a half. From that point on, his hopes of taking over the world really went downhill. Okay, I'm just going to walk around this room. This is the most exciting room that people are really interested in. And uh, no matter what museum you guys go to, you're not going to see a better collection than what I put together in the last 35 years. Okay, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. Okay, over here we have the artillery sergeant. Uh, we got the Panther, that's the tanker, the first generation of tankers. The next mannequin is the, uh, this is the Luftwaffe, that's the Air Force, this is the African Corps. We got the SS uniform, we got the camouflage uniform. Very, very rare. You'll probably never see another one of these. I paid $5,000 for this uniform, complete from the skull hat, the goggles, the gloves, to the boots. This is the 1944 jet fighter uniform. They say they only made this uniform for three months, 90 days, and then May 8th, 1945, the war was over. Okay, this is the general, and we got the SS Gestapo. If you turn around, these are all my Kaiser helmets. I have every hat and every helmet the Germans wore, World War I and World War II. Okay, these are called Kaiser helmets. These were over 100 years old. See how small their heads were back then? People were a lot smaller. There was no fast food. 
There was no Burger King, there was no McDonald's, there was no pizza, and there was no Wendy's. <laughs> okay, this is a perfect helmet. A helmet like this, give you an idea, goes anywhere from $1,500 to $3,000. Wow. Every year, all this stuff just keeps going up in value. It never goes down, not like the stock market. How do you get something like that? I use my credit card. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, uh, I've been collecting this stuff all my life, probably 50 years. So they know of you and they... they uh, well, I have a one-page ad in the Worldwide Military Magazine. Okay. Uh, it's been in there for almost 15 years, and that's how people find out I collect this. I don't go anywhere. They send me a, they email me a picture, they tell me what they want for it, I send them a check, and hopefully the box comes. I only got stuck maybe five times. Wow. You know, there's bad people in the world, but it's part of business. I'm not going to go to Europe and try to track them down. They know that. So uh, I did a lot with $8 million, you know. When the government builds a museum, they spend $8 million on the bathroom, and it's not completed yet. Where did you get $8 million? Where did you get $8 million? I work hard. I buy and sell houses. I run six businesses, always working my whole life since I was 13 years old, shoveling snow, painting houses, delivering newspapers. Work, work, work. Oscar, get over here where, and listen where to I, this. Where I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, you were taught to work. If you want something, you work for it. Yeah. Too bad about the newer generation now. Now they want something, their mommy buys it for them. Yeah. But uh, that's another story. Okay, so uh, yeah, follow me. I have 87 show cabinets, you know, in the museum. Uh, check out this Maltese cross collection. I have oh, every Maltese cross the Germans ever put out, 1914 to 1945. Here's a political uniform, just like Hitler used to wear in 1933. I got a picture of uh, Hitler wearing a uniform exactly like that. The same ribbons, the same medals. If I could prove that Hitler even tried on that uniform, it would be worth millions of dollars. Every hat, every helmet. Over here is all the gas masks they used from 1914 all the way to 1945. What hat? Yeah, that was uh, dug up. That's why it's all those Okay, guys, let's move it up. I'm going to show you the rarest thing I have in the You push the lever on the right side, the three barrels pop right out of the gun belt buckle. The firing triggers are on the left side, one, two, three. And uh, the one I'm going to show you, the serial number is number one. And 10 years ago, in 2012, I demonstrated it for the Discovery Channel. So it definitely works. The way I have it displayed, it's right here with the barrels out of the gun belt buckle. The original 22 bullets made in Germany are in front of it. And in front of the bullets, uh, there's a cuff band that the SS guys would have had on their left sleeve on their uniform. It says Führer's Headquarters. The next rarer thing is on the second shelf, there are eight millimeter wooden bullets. The Germans used to practice with wooden bullets because metal was a big thing during World War II. They don't want to waste any metal. Do you have anything from the Eagle's Nest? Uh, no. no. I wish I did, but... What's that? Even if I... That's where Hitler used to live, you know, in Switzerland. Now. But uh, even if I did, I'd have to prove that it came from there. You know, yeah. everything's got to you got to prove everything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't I don't want any uh, fake stuff. Yeah. Okay, so if you got a camera, take a picture of the belt buckle. It is in the history books. Yeah. Okay. So that the serial number is number one. If you look real close on the side of the belt buckle, the way it's displayed, it says 1944 SS number one on, stamped on all the parts, and it definitely works. You want to see that belt buckle in front of your house? You give me a bad check. Moving <laughs> 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 well, yep. down, folks. And some of you, when you get down to this end, can actually move over here so we'll get everybody. Okay, this part is pretty interesting. Come over here. You're at any survivors or the families up. You get upset. You yeah, know, yeah, so yeah. I had two ladies faint right here. Really? Yeah, they were 11 and 12 years old uh, back then. They had the numbers on their, uh, their left arm. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, they fainted. We had to take them outside, oh. give them water, you know. Wow. You know, it brings back a lot of sure. very, very bad memories. And over the years, we have people that don't even want to walk in here. <laughs> okay, guys, let's move it up. we got to keep going. There's a lot to see. We're just getting warmed up. I'll make sure you get your $20 worth.
tell you, man, I had a brother in law, Klaus Schneider, he was in the deserts of the German army. Oh, yeah? He met him when he was a little boy. And really? He flowers at a big ceremony. That's good. Wow. Yeah, oh, that's something. He thinks everything in Germany is bad. Okay, guys, let's move it up. Okay, the reason we have a Holocaust display like this is uh, it's part of history and uh, we want to show people what happened and ho hopefully it'll never happen again. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you about a few things here. I could spend two hours in this one room telling you about stuff. This is the most interesting room that people want to really know about. Okay, see this lantern here? Came back from Book of Wall concentration camp. Maybe the last time that candle was lit was 78 years ago. See all the armbands? I have every armband they wore in the Warsaw Ghetto. If you were lucky enough to go to a work camp and make parts and ammunition and stuff like that for the Germans, you probably would have survived the war. Okay, look at the ice pick from Dachau. I wasn't expecting to get the picture. See what they use the ice pick for? They got it in the uh, corpse's ears and they're probably dragging them from the gas chamber to the incinerator. These are 100% original Holocaust uniforms. I paid over $3,000 for each one. Uh, if I didn't buy it, some other museum would have bought it. This one here is from Sobor Concentration Camp from Poland, Auschwitz, Buchenwald, Dachau. After the war, all this stuff was gathered up. It was buried. It was burnt. The German people really didn't want the world to know what happened, but it was too big of a thing to hide. Okay. I'm going to show you some real important stuff here that you'll never see at another museum because they won't allow it. <coughs> okay, this is a very popular picture. This is a picture of the choosing ramp in Auschwitz. See that? See all the teenagers on the left side? And all the old ladies, the crippled people, the old men, the young kids on the right side? Okay? Uh, if you were lucky enough to go on the left side, you would go to a work camp. Those are the ones that the Germans wanted to keep, those uh, teenagers because uh, they could work them to death. And all the other people on the right side, they just want to get rid of, like right away. 80% of the time, uh, right from the choosing ramp, out of the boxcars to the choosing ramp, they go right to the hot showers. And the hot shower and the gas chamber were exactly, almost exactly the size of this room. And the reason I know that is because two years ago, my daughter's not here today. This is my daughter. I sent her to Auschwitz. See that? And she took the tour and found that everything that I say is true. See that? She visited three death camps in Poland. Because she's got to learn about all this stuff, because I'm not going to live forever. Okay, so anyway, the, the way uh, the Germans would get 250 to 300 people in a room like this, is they told them they're going to get water, they're going to get drinks, they're going to get clothes, uh, they're going to get fed, but they have to take a shower. So that made sense. As the people are going into the room, just like you people walked in here, uh, the Germans are handing out these soap bars made out of human fat. I have four of them right here. Uh, the Germans really didn't care if you soap up. That was part of the gimmick, you know, to get you in the room. Okay, then everybody's in the room. The, the door would lock. The hot water would go on. And my daughter said uh, the tour guides over there would tell them that the water was almost so hot it was boiling. And the people are screaming. Uh, the reason the Germans want people to take a hot shower is because hot water opens up the pores in your skin. And the next room, they're going to use Icon B gas, and the gas would penetrate easier if the pores in your skin are open. Okay, so now another door opened right next to the uh, gas chamber, uh, the, uh, the showers, and now they're all going into the gas chamber. There'd be uh, Germans up on the roof. Every 12 feet, there'd be a round pipe about 6-inch diameter. Uh, the Germans would have gas mask on. They'd open up the Zycon B gas canisters and the little white pellets, as soon as they hit the atmosphere, uh, they vaporize and uh, you breathe it and uh, you're dead in two and a half minutes. Okay, and these cabinets over here, these four cabinets, if you look at the Zycon B gas canisters, uh, they were never opened. I have 20 cans of unopened Zycon B gas, dated 1943. You see that? 1943. My daughter said in that museum they have the same cans, but those are open. That's no fun. You see that? 1943. Okay, listen. See that? So if this opens and the little white pellets atomize, you know, with the, uh, you know, vaporize and uh, we breathe it, we're dead. But I'm real careful with it. Right? <laughs> yeah. standing over here. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, now, all, now it's 250, 300 people all piled up on each other. They're all in there. They're all dead, right? Uh, what they do is they send these Jewish rats in there, and those would be the teenagers that they picked off the landing uh, dock. And they would wear, if they get picked to help the Germans, they would wear the Star of David. I got this from a rabbi uh, from uh, overseas. This is the uh, 
medal they wear. And they wear that on their uniform, like on the right side, he said. Okay, and that would show that they're helping the Germans. And the other M.A. would call them Jewish rats because they're helping the Germans. But they had to help the Germans or else they go into the gas chamber. Okay, the Germans would send them in with these claws, the serial number 324. See the serial number? Yeah, 324. And uh, I have two of them now. The other one's right there. Okay, this is the claw. They go in there. They put this around their wrist or their ankle. And see it locks? And they pull the body out of the gas chamber and hit the middle trigger here, and that would release the body. Just like this picture over here, they're all piled up outside the gas chamber. You can look at that on the way out. Okay, from that point on, uh, there'd be a couple of uh, Jewish rats, you know, uh, pulling the teeth out if they had gold teeth. They collected the gold teeth. And from that point, they'd go on a push cart, a rail system, or a wheelbarrow, and they'd take them right to the gas chamber. Auschwitz alone, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they gas 15 to 16,000 people a day. That's a lot of bodies to get rid of and a lot of teeth to pull. See that? Want to demonstrate? Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> okay, let me just point out a, a few bad people here. Um, Hermann Gording. Okay, he was uh, one of Hitler's right hand men, he was in charge of the Luftwaffe. Right? They caught him and he uh, committed suicide before they could hang him uh, with cyanide. Okay, very bad guy here, Joseph Goebbels. He was one of Hitler's right-hand men. And uh, one day after Hitler killed himself, April 30th, 1945, Joseph Goebbels killed his six kids in the bunker and his wife with cyanide and took it himself. Okay? Now, I told, just told you Hitler killed himself. One day before that... Uh, he tried out the cyanide on his German shepherd, Blondie, and Blondie died within two minutes, the, book, the history book says. Then the next day, he gave it to his wife, Eva, and then she died in two and a half minutes. And then Hitler actually took it himself, but he didn't wait to two and a half minutes for the cyanide to work, to foam up your saliva and you can't breathe. He took his uh, Walter's PPK 9mm and shot himself underneath the chin right through his head. That's the way the story goes. Okay, this is the worst guy of them all, Henrich Hemmler. It was his idea to kill all the Jews and Hitler's enemies. He was one of the first 12 people to join the Nazi party in 1921. Before that, he was a little skinny chicken farmer, a nothing. I could have I beat him up with my left hand. And he's responsible for killing over 6 million people. Mm. So he took cyanide to kill himself. Okay, now I'm going to show you the cyanide that they all used to kill themselves. Get your cameras up. You want to video this. Okay, I have two of these now. See this little brass canister? In the front it says SS. Did you see that? Okay, little canister. Okay, I'm going to open it up. If they, if they think they're getting tortured, they get caught, they don't want to reveal any military history, they'd open this up. Uh, you bite the little uh, glass uh, vial, and the cyanide would foam up your saliva, and you're dead in two and a half minutes. Watch how perfect this comes out. That's the cyanide the Germans took. It's about an inch long. You see that? You'll never see this in another museum. I have two of them now. Look how perfect that comes out. Yeah, open up. <laughs> uh, you're tired of working, paying all the bills. Uh, you're fed up with your wife. There you go. Fed up with Biden. <laughs> Is yeah, you're, you're fed up with those high gas prices. Or... <laughs> yeah. yeah, I hear somebody say something about Biden. Do we have Do we have anybody here to vote for him? Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> no one's dead here. People have come through here, yet we haven't found one person. Too scared. Well, we need target holders. Okay, guys, anybody have any questions? That's a bread basket came back from Dachau. They had to feed the pr the prisoners something, so they fed them bread and water. And one thing I forgot to show you, okay, see the passport books? If you were lucky enough to get a passport book, see, they rivet the picture to the paper. See that? Oh, yeah. Okay, see the approval stamp? See, it's half on the picture and half on the paper? Look at this. I got the approval stamp. <gasps> what? Yeah, see that? I paid $1,000 for this, so I better be here when the last guy leaves. <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys, you're learning a lot today, huh? Nice. Okay, let's go into the next room, the British. It's
Well, they, they found their bodies. They did, the, for sure. The, uh, one guy they never found, yeah. Joseph, yeah. Hump, right there. Yeah. Mengele, Joseph yeah. Mengele. See Mengele. the third yeah. picture? Yeah. Yeah. He was the head doctor in Auschwitz. He killed tens of thousands of people doing experiments yeah. that amounted to nothing. Yeah. And after the war, they couldn't find them. They never found him. Right. And they definitely found Hitler. They definitely uh, found him. Well, they say it was him. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that's what the history books say. Yeah. 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 The Russians apparently were the first two actually found Right. Yeah. Right this way. Okay, guys, let's move it up. That's all right. Of, of World War II, nothing really oh, took sorry. place, and it got nicknamed actually the Phony War. It wasn't until 400,000 British, the British Expeditionary Force had to evacuate out of Dunkirk is when really hostilities came uh, between Britain and Germany. One of the things you'll see that we have in this museum, we've got two of them here in the hallway, and this is, would have been the type of searchlight that the British used to detect the Luftwaffe coming across the English Channel. These are about a billion candle watt power, very, very bright. Some items that to look at in this room, and very interesting on the display here to my right, you'll see the Lee Enfield bolt action rifle, second most produced bolt action rifle in the world, next to the Mosin and the Gat. The one you're looking at is reinforced. It's reinforced because it carries the first grenade launcher that the British designed in 1917. Right below it, we've got two actually in this room, one here and one over in the corner. This is the British Sten submachine gun that I mentioned earlier in the Omaha, Utah beach display. It is chambered in a 9mm round, and believe it or not, in World War II, this only cost $11 to produce. One of the most produced uh, submachine guns in the world today. In the corner on the floor over there, you're going to see a light machine gun. This is our Bren light machine gun. And probably the most famous gun uh, that we have is right over here in the corner. This is our Vickers 303 caliber. It's a water-cooled machine gun. Uh, one of the most reliable machine guns any country has ever designed. There was reports out of World War I in 1916 that the British forces used this weapon and it fired over a million rounds. One single gun fired over a million rounds without having a malfunction. The British troops, very they, they loved it. It was super, super reliable. The Vickers also was the first machine gun to be installed on the biplanes in 1913, making the first combat aircraft. If we don't have any questions on the British, we're going to come around the corner. Come in this way. Okay, guys, come on in. Japanese. Eight cats. Is that where the cats went to? Yeah. I need the money. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. my. I got more. Yeah. Okay. Okay, guys. Yeah, no problem. So, back Japanese back. here. Okay, so uh, December 7th, 1941, a quarter to seven on a Sunday morning, two waves of Mitsubishi and Kawasaki airplane bomb Pearl Harbor, a total of 320. That's what got the Americans into World War II. Unfortunately, 3,478 young. Uh, American uh, soldiers, Marines, uh, civilians died that one day. Okay? Here's our 32nd president right there signing the Declaration of War, Franklin D. Roosevelt against uh, Japan the next day, uh, December 2nd. And uh, I know a real lot about Pearl Harbor, thanks to this guy right here. More than you could ever read in a history book. Okay? This is Pete. He was my dad's best friend, Pearl Harbor survivor. He lived right down the block here on Curtis Road. Uh, I know him probably close to 30 years before he passed away. And what makes Pete really special? When Pearl Harbor was being bombed, Pete was outside and took 36 pictures. He was a Navy photographer and a radio guy. Before he passed away, he donated all the pictures to my museum. These are the original oh. pictures that uh, Pete took. They're not even in a history book. He was my dad's best friend. From the, from the minute they woke up, in the morning, they go to IHOP for coffee or Sandy's restaurant until they uh, went for dinner at night. They were like this, always together. In fact, 10 times I told them they should have lived together, right? <laughs> they were, and they both died within like 60 days of each other. Uh, this is a picture of my dad. He was on the B-17 bombers. He did 13 missions over Europe. His name was Kermit. And uh, all he had to do was eight missions and he volunteers for five more. Aww. I was always mad at him because of that. I said, what are you trying to get, the Medal of Honor? You know, if he got shot down, I wouldn't be here. So, uh... So he was a pilot? No, he was the bombardier. Bombardier. Yeah. And, uh, see that standing in front of my half-track? That was, uh, probably 12 years ago. 
uh, because right after that picture, it was, uh, it was November 11th, Veterans Day, and I used to put 15 to 20 vehicles in the Veterans Parade every year. Okay, so anyway, so Pete was on the USS Maryland. That's the ship all the way on the right. He was up on the deck where he took most of the pictures. See that? USS Maryland. The next ship next to it would have been the USS Oklahoma, which took eight torpedoes to sink it. And then all the way on the left, in the black smoke, which you can't see, would have been the USS West Virginia. Okay, let me show you my favorite Pete's picture. In fact, I'm going to get this blown up bigger. See the airplane up in the air? Okay, that's a torpedo bomber. You see that? Okay, it's his job to come as close as he can to the ship and release the torpedo. I said, Pete, weren't you afraid the uh, torpedo's going to hit the ship you're taking the pictures on? He said, of course I was, but I had to get the shots. That was my job. Yeah, very bra a brave guy. I tried to blow up the airplane, but these pictures, the, the negatives, are still, they're like 80 years old, you know? That's pretty good. Yeah, but uh, we're real proud of Pete. Here's a picture of Pete 25 years ago, and look how young he looked. See him shaking his hand? And here's Pete about, I don't know, maybe six months before he died of cancer. Look how old he got. And look at Dragon Man, looks the same with the same t-shirt. <laughs> I'd say 80% uh, of the World War II veterans and Korean veterans died because of cancer. Uh, because back then, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, they thought it was always cool to walk around with a cigarette hanging out of your mouth. And uh, my mom and dad died because of cancer. My late wife's father died because of cancer. Okay, uh, I have 58 ceramide swords. 75% of these swords actually have the name of the families, and every one of them has a brand of the maker. You take the wooden pegs out, the wooden handle slides off, and I have the book home going a little over 500 years. And I can uh, tell by the uh, brand. They have a brand on all the uh, ceramite swords, just like the cowboys branded the cows. Within 40 years, I can determine when the sword was made. They were very, very, very proud people. Never, ever want to uh, give up. They carry these suicide knives in that belt. This one here has the family's name engraved in it. <coughs> These are sharp as a razor. See that? Okay, so if they think they're going to get captured, they get on their knees, they say a prayer, say goodbye to their family. Uh, they don't want to disgrace their family, so they just rather just kill themselves. They uh, push this right through their chest. Hopefully they hit their heart and they die right away. If they didn't have the suicide knife, this is Army issue Japanese in the original box uh, cyanide. They were told, even if they think they're going to get captured, they were told to take the cyanide. And of course, the cyanide is still in there. See the uh, Japanese writing? See on the, on the bottle? Okay, this is the original cyanide. Do you kids have a show and tell in school? <laughs> I can lend you some stuff, you'll be a big hit. <laughs> okay. Okay. You guys ready for this? Yeah. Okay. Here's the family pack. <laughs> what? All cyanide. So if you find out you lost your job, they're taking your new house away, they already took your car away, and you just found out your wife's been cheating for five years, I'll sell you one, a hundred bucks. Cash. Cash, it's got to be cash. <laughs> Everybody having fun? You know, you go to some of these museums around the country and it's so boring. You know, not my museum, we keep you on your toes. You know, gotta, gotta have fun. Okay, let me uh, show you a couple more neat stuff here. This is a Nambu Model 99 7.7 .7 fully automatic machine gun that came back from Iwo Jima. Unfortunately, that gun probably killed a lot of Marines. Uh, in World War I and World War II, you could bring home anything you could carry. They didn't even check anybody. You could have a bazooka, a mortar, a submachine gun. They really didn't care. But you had until May 8th, 1985, to register it. Uh, with ATF and get paperwork with those serial numbers. If you didn't, you could never, ever, ever get paperwork as I tried 50 times. Okay. They want to just uh, confiscate the gun, cut it in half, destroy it, and throw it away. So uh, I don't even, in the last, I don't know, seven, eight years, I don't even call them anymore. Okay, so we're talking about Evo Jima. In 36 days, February 19th to March 25th, 6,821 Marines died. It haunted this general the rest of his life. Holland Smith, that all those 17, 18, 19-year-old kids had to give up their life to take over a stupid island. 
but they had to take over the island because the B-29s were coming back from the bombing missions and running out of fuel. And if they landed in the ocean, there's nobody to rescue them. So three times more of that amount would have <laughs> perished uh, if they couldn't land on the island, on the runways. I read an article over 20 years ago, the last Japanese soldier caught in the caves in that island was almost three years after the war was over. Them guys just don't want to give up. Okay, let me tell you about the atomic bomb, August 6, 1945, with General MacArthur. Mm -hmm. Here's a picture of General MacArthur. And then in 1950, when Korea started, uh, President Truman put uh, MacArthur in charge of that conflict. This is every Nambu 6.5 caliber handgun. Okay, next room, Vietnam. We have any Vietnam veterans? How about draft dodgers? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody? Yeah? There's your brother. Oh, wow, that's my brother. Yeah. And uh, when did he get shot down? 1968. Right. August 24. Yep. So uh, we've got his pictures in the museum now. Glad to have it. Thank you. Okay, so anyway, <clears throat> I got drafted too in 1965, and uh, let me show you a picture of Dragon Boy. Dragon Boy. Yeah. Dragon Boy. Yeah. yeah, 18 years old. See, I was pretty good looking. A lot of yeah, girls after me. See, pretty cute. See, now I'm not good looking anymore. Now they want my money. <laughs> <laughs> That's people. That's, That's me. After. Yeah. And if and if they didn't cancel the draft, you'd be drafted soon. <laughs> in fact, let's talk about that. This is the letter I got in the mail. It tells you wh what time and where to report, right? And all my friends in Brooklyn and the Bronx got these, like, the same month. And to uh, tell you the truth, we were, you know, when you grow up in Brooklyn and the Bronx 60 years ago, that's a very bad neighborhood, right? And uh, we were, you know, getting bad, you know. And luckily, we got drafted, and less than three or four months, they straightened us right out. <laughs> and that's what they would have done to all these young kids that are disrespecting the cops and shooting up the schools. I think they should bring back the draft load them all up on a C-130 airplane, and drop them off in Ukraine for basic training. What do you guys think? Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But, you know, our President Joe Biden won't do that. He can't even ride a bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. Keep falling on the stairs. Yeah. Every time. Yeah, he needs training wheels. Yeah. That's funny. Okay, this is the hot gun in Vietnam. It's called the M60 machine gun. It shoots a rate of about 550 308 bullets a minute. I have four of these now. This is the way we had to dress in Vietnam. At, even at night, it was 108 degrees. In the daytime, 118. You're sweating 24 hours a day. It rains every night. Humidity. The insects are that big, an inch and bigger. Snakes all over the place. I mean, a terrible place to live. I tell you, if I was a judge in the United States and somebody committed a bad crime, I'd send him to Vietnam for six months with a tent and a sleeping bag. Uh -huh. And he could the British were fighting the Germans. The Americans got involved in 1917 to 1918. The Americans were led overseas with a very, very special general, the only six-star general in military history to get a six-star. Anybody know his name? Pershing. Right, John Pershing. Here's a picture of him right here. Okay, this is a uh, 1917 12-gauge uh, trench gun with a 16-inch bayonet. Over here, this is the first uh, Air Force aviation patch. That's a very, very rare patch. It wasn't called the uh, Army Air Force until 1948. It was the Army Air Corps. These are bolo knives going back to 1903. Over here, what makes Lieutenant Jim Butler very special in my museum Here's a picture of Jim Butler in his footlocker wearing this uniform 104 years ago. I got the whole setup uh, from a, a family in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm always getting more and more stuff. Okay, here's a picture of uh, Captain Smith. That's his, one of his uniforms. And this is the way his horse would have been set up in Europe. It's called a McCullen saddle. And this is the oldest World War I cantina half. See, it's uh, 1905. This one's 1907. Even the saddle soap is dated back then, 1918. Every country dated 98% of everything. They stopped doing that during Korea. If you got shot wounded, had to go to the hospital, this is what the nurses look like. See how skinny they were? Yeah, people were a lot smaller back then. Look at the shoes they wore. Unbelievable. 
In fact, 80% of all these mannequins I had to put on my jigsaw and give them a fast diet to make these uh, uniforms fit. This would fit like a 12-year-old. Uh, they were pretty small back then. Okay, so World War I was trench fighting. There'd be a trench two and a half, three miles long. Where the Nazi room is, which isn't that far away, there'd be another trench about two and a half miles long. And what they do is they shoot back and forth. Not for one month, but three or four months, they'd be shooting back and forth. In between both ch uh, trenches, the land would be full of all kinds of landmines, uh, barbed wire, all kinds of explosive devices, and they'd call it no man's land, right? Okay, in 1917, the U.S. government came out with these trench binoculars so they could look over the trench and not get their head blown off. When you got out of the Army, most of the soldiers got out after World War I in 1919, and you'd get an uh, honorable discharge. This one's 102 years old. See that? All the museums, all the collectors I ever talked to, nobody ever heard or seen a dishonorable discharge. Because if you were dishonorable back then, like the American Revolutionary War, like the Civil War, they tie you up to a tree and they shoot you. That's how strict they were back then. Okay, the one year the Americans were there, 12 months, we lost 50,300 soldiers. That's a lot of bodies in one year. Okay, I'm going to show you some World War I. In 1917, the Dodge brothers got an order from the U.S. government to make 1,000 of these. This is one of 1,000. The serial number is 147, and it runs great. You can't beat a Dodge. Yeah, yeah. yeah we don't have a lot of Fords in the museum because they rust out. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> okay, so it's a four-cylinder motor. It's only a 23 horsepower. Uh, Betty, I used to have Betty's picture here, but uh, I, she wanted it back, the original picture. Meanwhile, she passed away about seven years ago. I bought this about 20-something years ago. Uh, I offered her, she had the, uh, this advertised in the Worldwide Military Magazine. I offered her the most money. I sent one of my sons upstate New York. He rented a U-Haul truck, put it in the back, brought it back to Colorado. For about a month before I put it here, I drove it up and down the driveway around the uh, parking lot. And my brother would ride next to me with his vehicle, and he clocked me top speed, 28 miles an hour. <laughs> right. So, uh, but it runs real good. So anyway, the stuff I don't use for a long time, like this, see, I jack it up so it doesn't distort the wooden spokes or the tires. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, mm -hmm. the most important thing that they didn't invent back then was the fuel pump. If you look in any World War I history books, you're gonna see teams of horses pulling all kinds of vehicles uphill, even tanks. Because when the carburetor gets higher than the gas tank, there's no more gravity feed, mm -hmm. right? And the vehicle won't, the motor won't run. And then you see vehicles trying to go backwards up the hill so the gas tank is higher than the carburetor, but there's no traction and the wheels would just spin. And back then there was no batteries either. They didn't invent the battery until 1920. And uh, see, they all have magnetos. That's a magneto, gives the uh, motor a spark. Uh, all kerosene headlights and taillights, no juice brakes, they're called mechanical brakes. And I was real lucky to get this vehicle to show everybody. Okay, this here's a st uh, staff car. See, it's a regular four-door Chevy, Ford, or uh, Dodge. They went to a just regular car dealership and bought four-door vehicles, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Marines. Either they painted it all green, they put numbers on the hood, or they put a star on the door, and it became a staff car to get the uh, soldiers, you know, and the officers around the base. Now they have a million Humvees and take everybody all over the place. You're probably looking at this flag. It's got 45 stars. Anybody know the 45th state? And don't tell me it's Colorado, because Colorado's right in back of me, 38 stars. Alaska, very bad, very bad. That's the 50th state. Okay, the 45th state is uh, Utah. That flag's 126 years old. It was made 1896. The next uh, state inducted into America by... Uh, Theodore Roosevelt is right over there, Oklahoma, in 1908. And then in 1912, two more states were inducted into America by President William Taft. And that would have been 47, 48, uh, New Mexico, Arizona. Okay, and then uh, let's see, Dwight Eisenhower in 1950 inducted two more states. And that would have been 59 and 50. Uh, that would have been uh, Alaska and Hawaii. Right. Yeah, Alaska's 49, yeah. 
But uh, I have over 3,000 flags in the museum and over 5,000 helmets. Uh, if anything big happens in town, I have a helmet for everybody. <laughs> you know, when the Russians come. Everybody having a good time? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Museum. Yeah, follow me away this way, folks. Head down our vehicle row. On your left hand side, you're going to see a MASH unit. MASH actually stands for Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. You might be more familiar with the TV show MASH, but that actually took place in Korea. Ours is set up for Vietnam. The most common ambulance in Vietnam would have been the M43 ambulance that you see on your left hand side. Interesting thing about what the medics did with these ambulances, they actually took the white lighting out of the back and installed blue lighting. Anybody have any ideas of why blue lighting? So you could actually see blood at nighttime. On your right hand side you're going to see our Ben-Hur trailer. This trailer made pretty much out of wood as much as they could anyways. Ben-Hur trailer, most produced trailer in World War II. Just about 260,000 units were actually produced. On the inside of the row you're going to see another, some more half tracks. The first one is an M2 half track. The one beside me is our second M15 half track. And the one just behind me is the M3 half track. These half tracks weigh anywhere between 9, 9 and a half tons. Can reach speeds of about 42 to 45 miles an hour. You'll have a look inside, see where the driver and commander would sit, see where they would store their M1 Grand rifle. The M2 could carry four to six passengers, where the M3 could actually carry six to eight passengers, a little bit bigger. You also notice the, uh, the thickness of the metal on these vehicles. Not very thick. Um, if you, it, it would take really much of a high-powered round to actually get through them. If you looked in our German room, you notice we had a couple models of some German half tracks, or if you know your history, their vehicles were actually cantered. The sides of their vehicles were cantered. And this helped deflect or ricochet rounds off instead of actually penetrating straight through. At the back of the M3, you'll actually see a door. When you look through this door, this is the radio, the original radio to this vehicle, still operational today. You had a question? Hey, what's that big cannon? This one here? Yeah. Yeah, I'll talk to you about that in there. one second. As we keep moving through, folks, at the end of our row, you're going to see the M38A1 Jeep. This is Korean War era. And the gun that it's carrying is a 106 millimeter recoilless rifle. These ri wa rifles would actually drop between the windows, clamped into place, get, they would drive to where they needed to, raise it up, fire it, and move on. Because these weapon systems have no recoil whatsoever, you did need a heavyweight platform to actually carry them around on. The M38 was replaced in Vietnam by the M151A2. Dragon Command's got a total of 92 military vehicles in this museum. Every single one of them is operational, with the exception of the M47 Patton Battle Tank that you saw out front. Interesting note on the M47, it's the only Patton tank that did not see combat. Yes, sir. How did tanks get the main tank? Um, when they were first designed prior to World War I, uh, they were actually designed and they had a shape of like a water tank, what they used to store water tanks in there. And so instead of being able to um, explain, you know, that they were a motorized uh, a weapon system, they needed to come up with a code word or something that would not let the enemy or the enemy forces know what they were creating. And so they said because it looked like a water tank, that's how it actually got its name, the word tank stuck. Yeah. On your right hand side as we move up folks you're going to see our collection of M1 landmines. If I wanted to I could get these M1s operational. We still have all the explosives and detonators with us right here. I won't just in case. But These M1 landmines were designed to be buried just below the surface of the ground. They are an anti-vehicle landmine. You'll also notice all the different landmine detectors that the US military used throughout World War II. You look at them and you don't think that they're very high tech or sophisticated, but actually back they dinner that night, right? Well, maybe ground beef, maybe not steak. <laughs> on your right hand side, you're gonna see a 500 pound cluster bomb. On your left here, this is our M422 Mighty Mike Jeep. 
first vehicle the U.S. military designed after World War II. It was designed for the Marine Corps. Only 1,250 of these were actually produced, designed to be able to be launched or dropped from aircraft. And the container you see in front of it still houses the parachute for this vehicle. Along the back wall, we've got a 1941 Ford bomb truck. And yes, it is carrying a 1,000-pound napalm bomb. On your left at the end of the row, this is the M181 millimeter mortar that I talked about in the Omaha, Utah beach room. World War II era, and this would have a kill radius of about 75 feet. As we keep moving around the corner, look off to your right, you'll see a lot more of his collection of military vehicles in the corner. He's got a deuce and a half, Vietnam era. He's got a couple of those on the property. Then also along the right-hand side wall, you're going to see five 850-pound cluster bombs. These cluster bombs, this version of the, the cluster bombs, were designed to be able to be dropped from the aircraft. They would get to about 100 to 200 feet above the enemy forces and explode. When they would explode, they would send down 650 one-inch uh, size steel ball bearings down on the enemy forces basically obliterating everything below them. It's one of the reasons why the Geneva Convention banned them from warfare. Although somebody should tell the Russians of today. Off to your right, you're gonna see the M37 Jeep, probably the most common Jeep over in Vietnam. And then over here on the left-hand side, this is an interesting little vehicle. This is our M29 Studebaker Weasel. It is an amphibious vehicle, it's a track vehicle. It was designed for an actual operation in Norway. That operation did not take place, so the military needed to find different avenues to use it. It did serve along the Western Front in Italy. It was there during Operation Overlord or the invasion of, of Normandy. The Marines used it in Iwo Jima, but it really got its notoriety during the Battle of the Bulge. Because it could get to areas where your most common jeep couldn't get to, it actually acted as a mini ambulance that would ferry dead and wounded soldiers off the battlefield. Because this vehicle has got such a light footprint when it goes over the ground, it was known to be able to go through minefields without detonating any mines. I don't know if I'd want to be the driver when they did decided to go on that route. Yeah. On your right hand side you're going to see this collection of M151s. On your left is a 1955 GMC bomb truck. It is carrying a bunch of 500 pound bombs. You notice these bombs are painted blue. Anytime the military paints any of their ordnance blue, it means they are training rounds. As we round the corner, you'll see his collection of Humvees. As we come around the corner, folks, look to your right. You're going to see a vehicle. This is a Vietnam era vehicle. This is the Gamma Goat. They produced just over 14,000 of these. It was made by the LTE or LTV Aerospace Company. And every veteran that I've talked to that's familiar with this vehicle, they say it's the worst vehicle the U.S. military ever designed. Just to kind of give you an idea, this vehicle couldn't go more than 20,000 miles without having a major mechanical failure. It would take just about four hours just to do an oil change on it. When the forces would head out and this vehicle was involved in the force, they would actually send this vehicle out a day or two ahead of the main body so they could all arrive at the same time. Yeah. It is supposed to be amphibious, and then again, every time I say that, the veterans that are familiar with this vehicle, they all laugh at me, so apparently it didn't float very well. On your left hand side you're going to see the M16 half track. This is an anti-aircraft platform. You'll see the quad mount and the aircraft nest. Uh, unfortunately ours only does have the two barrels on it, but typically we would have four 50 caliber Browning machine guns. On the sides you'll see the, uh, the tombstone ammo canisters carry about 250 rounds of 50 caliber ammunition. On this plate cabinet over there you'll see what a 50 caliber round looks like. And the steel plate that you see on the table has a couple of holes in it. This is a two inch solid steel plate and this is what an armor piercing round can do to uh, this plate. 
So in World War II, the Luftwaffe was running low on pilots near the end of World War II, and our guys didn't have anything to shoot at. So they actually turned it into an anti-personnel vehicle. In Korea, when it served in Korea, the aircraft was getting a lot more technical, a lot more advanced. So our guys, again, didn't have anything to shoot at, so they turned it into an anti-personnel vehicle. You can imagine what a 50 caliber armor piercing round could do to a steel plate that size. Imagine what it would do to a human body. You know what our GIs nicknamed this vehicle? The meat I'm chopper. Like, like, hey, I actually got a laugh, Charles. Woohoo! You're coming to the front of the tour. All right. The rest of you, tour's over. We're going home. Oh, jeez. Charles is laughing at I guess I've been working here too long. My sense of humor's gotten a little bit dark. I mean. So as we keep coming up, folks, you're going to have a look at our display. This is the Battle of the Bulge, December 16th, 1944 to the 25th of January, 1945. The Battle of the Bulge was the third bloodiest campaign the U.S. has ever fought, and the bloodiest battle actually occurred at the Bulge itself. For those that are not familiar with this battle, it took place primarily in the Ardennes Forest region, which we have a couple maps here out front. It was basically the Germans' last counteroffensive to stop the Allied advancement from coming in from the west, all right? They were going to try to simulate a maneuver that they did in 1939 when they invaded Poland. It's called a Blitzkrieg. What they wanted to do was Blitzkrieg through 410,000 German forces to split that Allied advancement and circle them, kill them, and stop them. But it didn't work. All it did was create a bulge in the defensive posture, and that's how it got its name. There was two key battles of the bulge itself. Uh, Elsenborn Ridge, where the Americans stopped the Pan German Panzer Division from coming across. And then when the 101st Airborne Division got encircled at the town of Bastogne. I don't know if everybody knows that story, but it's probably the most famous that comes out of the bulge. A lot of movies and TV shows were made of it. Those that don't know, I'll explain a little bit. The 101st Airborne Division got encircled at the town of Bastogne. And the German commander actually sent the letter over to Brigadier General McCulloch, who was the commander of the 101st. He says, we have you surrounded. You need to surrender. And what was Brigadier General McCulloch's response? Nuts. Nuts, right? So when that information got translated back to the Germans, it actually got translated as, go to hell, we're not <laughs> surrendering. So that battle actually raged on for six days. And it took General Patton, who we have a picture of here right up front, with three divisions, which number about 45,000 men to come in and relieve the 101st Airborne. With that battle, General Patton actually received his four star. I mentioned about the third bloodiest campaign. We had over 89,000 casualties and over 19,000 dead. If you look the way our soldiers are dressed, okay, winter of uh, 44, uh, coldest on record, temperatures dropped down to minus 20, minus 30 degrees. They weren't getting resupplied because of the weather conditions. And a lot of those casualties, believe it or not, were due to frostbite. They weren't properly dressed. They didn't have winter coats, gloves, boots. And so a lot of those casualties, believe it or not, were due to Mother Nature. Any questions on the bulge? No? Nope. Okay. Let's round the corner. As you come around the corner, you also notice we've got a piece of the Berlin Wall there. As we come around the corner, I will look down to your left in front of the tank. You're going to see the SG-43. This fires about 750 rounds a minute out to about 1,200 yards. This is what replaced the PMM-1910 in 1943. Now we're going to talk about my favorite vehicle in this museum. This is our T-54 medium-sized battle tank. I say medium-sized because it only weighs 39 tons. The one you're looking at actually served in the Czechoslovakian Army. All the electronics and communication gear are uh, in working condition. Dragoman has the breach for this gun, so if he wanted to, he could install it and fire the 100 millimeter shells that you see out front. Yes, it is fully operational. You'll actually see pictures of Dragoman driving it around his property. I think that would be just too cool. The T-54, most produced tank in the world, and the first prototype was actually designed in 1945. The last vehicle that I will talk about in this room, this is our M125 mortar platform. It is based off of the M113 troop transport vehicle. 
You'll see the steel plate at the back of this vehicle. This is where the M29 81 millimeter mortar would be mounted. The roof actually opens up to allow our guys to fire the mortars up and through the roof of this vehicle. So again, myself and Charles, we're Navy, so I need to ask the question, any of my veterans, Army, any Army guys? Okay, oh good, a few hands, good, good. I get to poke fun a little bit of my brothers here. On the ramp, you'll see we've got the operation manual. Believe it or not, on page three, it actually says, don't forget to open the roof. <laughs> Army guys, not always the smartest, right? Yeah. <laughs> now, if I said that about the Air Force, they'd be crying right now, so it's a good thing, because I don't have any Kleenex with me. <laughs> One of the largest producers of military vehicles in World War II. You'll notice we have a lot of the WC and BC series vehicles. You'll see that on display. We've got pictures of the top five generals of World War II. Some might have heard this is the class the stars fell on when they went through their training. Okay. Keep coming around this way, guys. Keep moving in. Keep coming down, guys. We do have more chairs here. You can go sit down. Tired or needs to get off their feet. Kansas showing Union, the American flag went from 34 stars. Uh, this is the Confederate national flag. This is the Confederate battle flag. People call the rebel flag. And as soon as the, uh, the war started, the first uh, conflict was in a bull run, only uh, 15 miles from the White House. Uh, they lost like 5,000 uh, Americans on, on both sides. So after that, uh, the Union Army uh, blocked everything off north of Virginia. So the Confederate Army couldn't go up north anymore and get their firearms. Hey, why don't you guys go sit down? You've been bothering me all morning. Okay, so they couldn't get their firearms up north, so they went overseas, you know, and bought Enfield from Great Britain. Uh, this is the most popular uh, Enfield 58 caliber uh, ball and cap uh, rifle that the Confederate Army used. Uh, this here is the most uh, popular Springfield Armory 58 caliber uh, black powder rifle that the uh, Union Army used. And this is what a 58 caliber uh, lead ball looks like. Yeah, you can't hit with that. Uh, it's going to do a lot of damage. Okay, if you're looking at this here, this is called a blunderbuss. That's the shotgun uh, that they used back then. And there was no shotgun shells back then. Uh, what they did is they put black powder in here. They put a cap underneath the, uh, the hammer there. And uh, the reason it's got like a funnel edge here on the barrel is because they'd scoop up the pebbles, the rocks, and the dirt, and that would be the ammunition, and they shoot it right in the face of the enemy, called the blunderbuss. I wonder who uh, named that. <laughs> okay, let me name some important people here. Uh, this is Grant. He was our 18th president. He's on your $50 bill. This is Robert E. Lee. He was the head general for the uh, Confederate Army. And uh, April 9th, 1865, uh, Robert E. Lee surrendered to Grant uh, north of Virginia in a little uh, small town uh, in a little courthouse. Uh, this guy here is uh, George Custard. Uh, he was an Indian fighter. Unfortunately, he died at Little Bighorn June 25th, 1876, fighting the Lakota and Cheyenne warriors. He was in charge of the 7th Cavalry. He had about 600 men under him, and he was supposed to go up there, just scope <coughs> everything out. Uh, wait for reinforcements, but he was the kind of general that just wanted to do things his way and make a name for himself. He ended up uh, attacking the Indians. The Indians that weekend had 2,500 warriors. Uh, he was really outnumbered. He only lasted four hours. Only one man survived. Uh, after one hour of fighting the Indians, he knew that he couldn't uh, win, and he sent one soldier to get reinforcements, but it was too late. I don't know if you, any of you guys were up there, but it's all flat plains. There's no place to hide. The 7th Cavalry shot all their horses so they have something to hide behind. Uh, the Indians were very equipped. They had the latest gun available, the Spencer repeating rifle. Uh, four, four months before that, they ambushed the 5th Cavalry wagon train delivering those weapons uh, to the fort. Uh, this is what the weapon looked like. 
It holds eight rounds in the uh, stock, one in the chamber, that's nine shots. And if you ever seen that movie, The Rifleman on TV, they go like this, The Rifleman, that's how fast that gun shoots. That was the machine gun back then. And the Indians had, had uh, they were using those against, uh, you know, custard. Uh, that's uh, 53 caliber. Look at the size of that bullet. 53 caliber. Now the... Uh, Springfield made this for the U.S. government. It's called the trapdoor gun, and the caliber is 5070. That bullet would kill an elephant. Look at the size of that bullet. Okay, and that was made right after the uh, ball and cap black powder rifle. Uh, but that was a trapdoor gun. You have to pull the cocking handle back, open up the trapdoor, put the one bullet in the barrel, close the trapdoor, aim it, and fire it. And it would probably take another 20 seconds to reload it. So the Indians had a, a big advantage, the trapdoor gun. Each one of those guns I paid about $5,000 for. They're very so rare and very hard to find. Most of this stuff, 75% of all this stuff here, the Civil War and the American Revolutionary War, uh, all those guns here, 75% uh, of all of them came from uh, other museums around the United States that went out of business. Okay, then we got uh, Abraham Lincoln here. He's on your $5 bill. He was our 16th president. Unfortunately, uh, at 10 o'clock at night, April 14th, at the Ford Theater, him and his wife were uh, watching a show. A bad guy snuck up there. His name was John Booth and shot Lincoln on the right side of his head behind his ear with a 44 caliber Derringer. Yeah, this is the uh, picture I used to show people I cut out of my history book. But now I have something better to show you. Last year, I got this from another museum. This is as close as you get to the gun that shot Lincoln. The same manufacturer made in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Same caliber, same make, same model. And this is the size of the ball, just like the one that went into Lincoln's head. He died the next day, April 15th, 1865. See that? All these, uh, all these black powder rifles and handguns are supposed to be fully operational. We never shot any yet, but sometime this summer, I like to make a video and shoot a few of these. Uh, but, uh, you know, these guns are 160 years old, very old, they could blow up in your face, and I'm too important, you know, to, to test them. So I was going to see if uh, Justin, for an extra $25, maybe Justin will try it out. 30? Okay, 35. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Justin could be replaced. I can't. Okay. I'm just joking. Don't be a crybaby. <laughs> Okay, guys, now I'm going to tell you about the guy. Because the men back then, they, were, they weren't used to taking orders from nobody. They were drunks, they were farmers, they were bums, and uh, they'd go practice with George Washington for two days, and then they want to go home. That's what he had to put up with. He had a very hard time. So he got a hold of Benjamin Franklin. He's on my favorite bill. He was a diplomat. And his job was to talk to the French government to get soldiers to come back and help George Washington create the first army and help fight the British. Benjamin Franklin didn't have a, uh, he didn't have a hard time doing that uh, because uh, back then the French people hated the British. So they sent tens of thousands of soldiers